Hi, everyone, and welcome back to That UFO Podcast. On this show, I am delighted to finally be joined by the creator of UAPcaucus.com. He is a graduate of Princeton, which is no small feat, uh, a product designer among many achievements in life. I'd like to welcome Lester Nair to the podcast. Lester, welcome. Andy, how are you, my friend? Great to be here. Very good to have you on. Uh, I love your voice, by the way, and a little bit of research for this. I watched some of your podcast appearances recently. You were on a podcast with a, a woman called Christina. She's uh, like Christina, a mom. Yes, Christina, yeah, where yeah. my mom's at from the um, Your Mom's House Comedy Network out in Austin, Texas. Had never seen it before. I loved her. Uh, and I think as the US, Americans would say, she had a potty mouth. Um, <laughs> yeah. Which, yeah, as someone from Scotland, I could 100% appreciate. So um, I really like that. So yeah, awesome. Listen, Lester, for anyone listening to this, I want to get you on to talk about UAP Caucus, yep. the, the social media feed, uapcaucus.com. Mm -hmm. um, and when you say it, it's going to sound much nicer and people will understand what's being said rather than me saying caucus. Uh, <laughs> And we'll get to what that actually means as well. But first off, who who is Lester Nair? What's your background? Yeah, no. So I'm sort of a very generic, typical, um, you know, immigrant American. I was born in Montreal, Canada. I've lived in the U.S. since I was three. Um, footballer, uh, Chelsea fan. So if there are any uh, footballers out there, uh, definitely fan of the Premier League. But you know, throughout my life, I've been very involved in and around tech and politics, um, it, from a media angle specifically. And you know, as I got out of university, began sort of following the UFO topic. The original entry point was the WikiLeaks dumps with DeLong and Podesta and the Joint Chiefs. And, you know, at the time I'd had a very mundane, potentially prosaically explainable sighting in 2012, so four years before that. And I didn't think about it anything at the time, but after I saw the Podesta DeLong stuff come out, it kind of made me think back to like, oh, huh, this is curious. I have some grounded context from a experience or perspective to want to maybe pay more attention to this than other people would. And from there, it became a very deep sort of casual passion for me to follow the progress, which shortly after became the TTSA launch, the uh, Leslie Keen, Ralph Blumenthal 2017 New York Times article, and obviously all of the legislation that followed. And I think as more legislation came out, given my background, having worked in local and federal politics on the sort of fundraising and campaigning side, I just felt that there was a gap in the government's understanding and progress on the issue and the public's understanding and progress on the issue. And the main reason that I felt that that existed was the media has basically been absent in keeping up to the public up to date on what's been happening. Um, so I, th there's really a gap there, which I think has now been filled by not only some of the work that I've done at UAP caucus, but several other entities such as Nick Gold and Declassify UAP, as well as Mo over at Disclosure Diaries. Yeah, I think that's very fair. And uh, again, just apologies to any Chelsea fans out there having to remember you're a Premier League side who there's more chance of aliens being confirmed this year by the US government than is Chelsea win any, anything at the minute. We're definitely not getting to Champions League anytime soon. Oh, God, uh, not getting to Conference League anytime soon. Maybe <laughs> championship, but totally different podcast. All the people who hate football are switching off now. Um, we'll get back to UFOs. Um, you mentioned uh, your own potentially prosaic mundane explainable sighting but do you want to go into the detail on that because i think it's very fair you put across that it's potentially very explainable but what was it yeah no so it was it was it was two sightings over the course of a, a, a couple of weeks in the summer of 2012 and um it was a typical i guess like type one sphere situation so if you if anyone has listened to the recent canadian pilots that came out from a the January 19th sighting that CTV News covered, my sighting is almost identical to what those pilots were describing. Orbs, mine were amber in color. There were three, six, sometimes in formation. They seemed to be doing this very peculiar movement and dance in the sky before, you know, both dropping and then disappearing in a very bizarre fashion. Now, it, that doesn't necessarily sound prosaic when I explain it, but it's it was not long enough or I got a consistent enough understanding of the situation to really have any qualification of what it may or may not have been. So I suppose prosaic in the sense that if you were relaying that to someone with without an interest in UFOs, they're probably going, you saw some lights in the sky. That's it, you know. Right. Or the obvious like, oh, it's probably military testing. I, you know, you, we're not far from Fort Bragg. So, you know, a couple hours. So there's, again, for folks who might not be as, as um, into the issue, it's almost not worth kind of going that direction because it's just lights in the sky, as you say, which is exactly how people reacted to 
the Canadian pilot sightings when they clearly said it's not Starlink, it's not these things, the military's not flying, but people still kind of fall to that conclusion. Yeah, and I think that's fair. Earlier today on Twitter, I still call it, you know, X, whatever people want to go with, the cool kids these days. Um, one of the listeners commented on um, something I said on the recent listener call in that I felt my Black Triangle sighting from 2019 was far less interesting than the, the podcast logo sighting, which is uh, <laughs> over there. Um, right. And I was like, and, and he said, that doesn't seem to make sense just to him. He was like, surely the Black Triangle was closer up and everything else, and it's more recent and fresh. And I was like, yeah, but there's still a chance. What I'm seeing is a shape in the sky. It's against a black sky, a black object. It's a silhouette. I can see two lights, which then became a third. I could have misidentified something. I don't think I did from everything that happened at that time. And like you say, I think how quickly it happened as well, That that's important. Yes. It's it's relatively prosaic because I'm next to an airport. Yep. I'm pretty good with what the airplanes look like at various heights and distances, but Same. I'm not an aviation expert. So it is what it is. And I think I saw X, but it could have been Y. However, when you see something that looks like a huge Ferris wheel at an angle, spinning at an incredible rate, yes. it's not up in the sky, it's really low down for other people. For me, that's more tangible in a way that you know you can you can back that up as being something more exotic but who knows it could have just been an incredible ferris wheel that was set up at the time and killed everyone on board you know these things happen um but i, I do say lester something i've wanted to have you on for for a while the the site and the social media began in i think september 2023 yes, round about then um i think 2023 i mentioned to you before we recorded was the year congress really got involved in a grassroots way it mm -hmm. seemed to be congress started quite high level it seemed to be in this topic with gillibrand and co a year or two ago some of the bigger names bigger players warner rubio coming out making comments on on high mainstream news high profile mainstream news it didn't seem to go anywhere though and then all of a sudden you had this groundswell of new up and coming again from an outsider yep. politicians like luna Burchette you know, uh, God, uh, Gates and these folks, uh, Burleson, who out of nowhere suddenly went, yeah, I'll, I'll take the reins on this UFO, UAP thing. Yep. And is that what really caught your eye last year as, as being like a big win? I, I think that's absolutely right and, and a great breakdown. And I think, you know, there's basically been a time delay between where Congress has been, right? So you can look at now we know, you know, some of these senators have been hearing these classified briefings, you know, between 2019, 2020, 2021, which led to the UAPTF, which is why we even got Grush in the first place, which became AIMSOG and then Arrow. So all of that had been happening. But as you sort of point out, the, the participation amongst other members of Congress, whether it's in the House or the Senate, did not really begin to expand until the year 2023, even though by that point, the UAPTF had been closed for maybe two years or something like that. So I do believe that that 2023 was the threshold where it went from a small group of vocal insiders, uh, Senators Gillibrand, Rubio, to now a more distributed, decentralized group. And it is interesting, the efforts in the Senate seem to be completely disconnected to the efforts in the House. So the sort of the House Congressional UAP Caucus that's led by Representative Burchett seems to have arisen out of genuine organic curiosity. And the way I've been describing what's been transpiring in the U.S. Congress over this issue is we appear to be seeing an authentic, organic, constitutional struggle between the legislative branch, which is Congress, um, Senate, House, they control the purse springs, uh, the purse strings, and the executive branch, which is the White House, the military branches, and the intelligence community, over who has control over this material. And that, that seems to me to be genuinely what's happening. The Gang of Eight clearly isn't in the loop, which is why we got the UAPDA. Uh, we have systems of oversight that are not applying to this IRAD process. And I think Congress is legitimately concerned about that, regardless of what the programs, the alleged programs ultimately have underneath. Um, but again, I think the House is starting from the beginning of the race, and they're just looking at the money and the corruption, and then maybe it leads to crafts and bodies. It appears to me that the Senate has a much stronger position that those crafts and or bodies do exist and there needs to be something done about it. So that that friction, I think, is interesting. 
for those who may be listening, particularly outside of the US, I don't know if, if Canada has this, what is a caucus? Yes. So um, a caucus is just a general term for sort of a group of members with a shared you know, political or, you know, uh, other objective within the halls of power and government. So as an example, um, there are things like the Congressional Black Caucus, which in the U.S., you know, race issues, black, white issues are very prominent. So they focus on promoting and focusing on black related issues. You have this for all kinds of special interest groups, whether it's for cultural reasons, religion, uh, or things like, you know, the uh, the Green Caucus, which is focused on renewable energy stuff and sort of the mm -hmm. Green all that so it's really just a way to have a collective of people within either a single uh chamber so it can be a house only caucus it could be a senate only caucus it can also be bicameral which means there are members in both sides and they just the idea is there's power in numbers when we are advocating for certain policy or going into negotiation processes in the u.s that the caucus system has kind of been a little bit perverted where now you have groups that are just in there to cause disruption and because they vote in a block you kind of have to take them seriously which mm -hmm. is kind of where you've seen the uh battle over the speaker of the house the leader in the yeah. house with um uh speaker mike johnson coming in speaker mccarthy getting kicked out that was effectively a battle of caucuses within the uh Republican Party battling over power and what direction they wanted to go with their control within the House. I know some people's eyes are probably glazing over, but that's that's sort of the in the weeds details. I lose track of the House, Senate, Congress, uh, that kind of stuff. So if I get these things wrong, just correct me. Uh, I do it on a regular basis. Um, but I wonder where where has this grassroots movement come from? Because like I say, we seem to have had this the other way around where high profile high ranking folks senators mm -hmm. got involved in uap did for you did that just not seem to go anywhere or not work that it suddenly reverted to because again like people like tim burchett and co people tell me he's not a, a really Im important and much as a congressman powerful congressman he's yes, he's sure. much newer he's much fresher yes. um and where his influence or impact would be lesser than others who have been around longer that was my understanding um yeah. Tim's been wonderful coming on the podcast and his politics aside, whatever he does, I'm not in the US. I don't pay attention to that stuff. Um, but the UFO side of things, he's really taken the kind of the bull by the horn as such, as with others. So what happened in your ideas that this kind of grassroots movement seems to not only have started, but seems to have gained traction? And I wonder where do you think it's going to go? So I think the reason the grassroots roots movement really started was because of the vacuum of leadership or a, or a clear strategic vision around proponents for more transparency around this issue. I mean, like we've talked about, there have been senior high level officials since at least, you know, 2017, if you want to count sort of the lose and et cetera, or, you know, pushing it further to the 21, 22 era, the media never picked it up. No one stayed consistently on the story, but there is massive public demand for more information about this issue. And no one was simply servicing that demand. So I think honestly, there were just a lot of people who are close to this issue for a whole variety of reasons, whether they're an experiencer, whether they're coming from politics, whether they're coming from a national security background, who just felt like, if not me, then who? I And, and based on the conversation I've had with some of the people that tried to start some of these grassroots efforts, there are those of us who have experience in doing this in other subject matters that are just applying the mechanics to this issue. So as an example, if you look at popular topics that are really prominent in the U.S. congressional conversation today, the border, the Ukraine crisis, the Israel-Hamas crisis, a um, couple of other elements, they have very strong grassroots political organic movements that are consistently pushing, calling, doing the fundraising, all the typical things you see. That never existed until effectively, at least at scale, uh, 2023. Obviously, there have been historical efforts, um, like some of the stuff Stephen Greer did in the 90s, where they had the um, the presentation in DC. But uh, th there's sort of a difference, in my view, between bringing uh, whistleblowers forward in order to get them to engage in Congress, which what has been happening, and bringing the rest of the public up to speed on where we actually are with the UAP issue. Because again, I think there's been so much that's happened in the last whatever it is six seven years that most people most people in the public have zero real context of 
let alone all of the historical history going back to the 40s and how we are actually rinsing and repeating the cycle. So I, I honestly think the organic nature of the political grassroots disclosure movement really arose out of a frustration of not getting any direction from ostensibly the leaders of the movement who you could pull any name out of a hat if you want to say it's the the melons the elizondos the graves etc those who have come forward i do give ryan graves a lot of credit because he's focused a lot on how do you create change with things like his new uh safe aerospace for americans bill but um there just wasn't anybody doing it and you know the information was so fantastical that i think people particularly with grush coming forward and doing the congressional hearing there was now a real anchor to sort of base you know interest in the issue on if you have someone giving testimony under oath on top of the fact that the uapda is one of the most astonishing pieces of legislation um in in the modern era in general um the existence of those two things without any infrastructure i i think forced a lot of us off of the sidelines you mentioned the the media cycle before where we saw frustratingly a repeat i think of what we've seen in previous years where there's a period of weeks maybe i'm being generous to say a month month or two where mainstream media pick up a story run with it and then it goes away again and we can never seem to have it stay or really click into gear 2023 it was the grush story and his comments really did translate worldwide to the point we had it here in the uk i was fortunate to speak on some radio shows and tv shows even about it this face on tv was terrifying and um, oh. people cancel tv licenses oh. worldwide i uh, know but it, it, that's that was how big an impact it had people wanted to know who were like this guy's saying some really incredible things it lasted in the uk if i'm right the grush comments kind of hit the news cycle on like the wednesday or the thursday and by the tuesday after in the uk the story was gone that that was it so not, not even a full calendar week i don't think a seven day a seven day cycle lasted longer in the states because it's someone from the u.s government somebody who's who's speaking saying incredible things in congress um the people who were coming out like your lunar burchettes burlison's gates who were, were talking about this but it still went away how how do we get that to kick in but stay and stay a focus of the mainstream media it's there, there are a couple of, I think, um, variables to this. I think it's a really great point and a really great question. Um, there's obviously the stigma that's existed in the media, and part of it is a generational thing, whereas you see older producers start to age out and younger producers starting to come in, they're naturally just going to be more open-minded about giving the topic some airtime. So I think um, there is sort of inertia in the media space to stick to the things that they know that work. And frankly, I think we all know, like, the UFO content, like, when it's having official channels and stuff gets plenty of views and would drive revenue. But I think the, the generational stigma for producers who choose what they focus on is, is part of the problem. So that's just a waiting game to, to, to one extent. I think the other aspect to this is, um, you know, how do you define what's newsworthy, right? And, mm -hmm. and, you know, how do we create more opportunities for there to be things that are, quote, newsworthy related to the UAP topic? And I think part of what, how we can get there is, one of the kind of concepts that Ryan Graves talks about, which is there's actually two paths that we need to be focusing on in tandem right now. One side is the dis disclosure path, the government documentation, the whistleblowers, and like what materials do they have or not have. And then the other path is the discovery path, which is what we're seeing with Seoul, Galileo Project, the uh, new Lumina Journal for UAP Studies. There needs to be a dispersion of the sources that are cultivating new things about the topic because then there are now more opportunities for folks to say, oh, if we don't want to cover it from this political angle, oh, the Seoul Conference or what Dr. Jacques Vallée is talking about where you might see the San Francisco Chronicle cover it because he's a legend in the Valley here in, San, in the, the California area. And there's a context for them to consider it to be newsworthy. So I think expanding the sandbox of things that are actually being worked on, built the infrastructure to maintain the story when the media doesn't continue it is a big aspect to this. I mean, this is what you've been doing, right? And what of a lot of online media channels have been doing already. And I think just continuing to grow that base, we sort of need to be the ones to maintain it because currently we're in a, a wait, we're in a reactive state where we wait for the next drop from an insider or wait for the next report to come out. And then 
react to that and say, oh, look, look, look. I think mm -hmm. instead there needs to be a proactive position which identifies what are the areas in which we need to make progress. And I think there are quite a few. As an example, there's no way to onboard someone who doesn't know anything about this issue into the topic. What do I mean by that? It's very difficult for someone to fit, to get, just get a base understanding. UAP Guide tries to do this with a little bit of um, just the basic information quotes. But for the most part, the content we create as a community is for the community of people yeah. who already understand all this information. But there is no infrastructure for the people who don't know who Kirkpatrick is or what Arrow means or how the different levels of government classification work. So there's almost needs to be an educational arm to the community that builds out material that assumes people know nothing, right? And then also gives them an entry point from different aspects. Some people care about the government aspect. Some people are more interested in the experiencer aspect and the story of real people. Um, so that infrastructure outside of the media, I think will help bubble up more newsworthy opportunities for them to pick up that are not solely waiting for the government to take action. And then there's a whole variety of other reasons why I think that'll help lift up all boats. But that's kind of how I think about the problem, if, if that makes sense. No, it does. And it makes me think, and you maybe said this as part of what you've said there. Does that mean the mainstream news cycle as we know it, which we talk about in the US, Fox, CNN, NBC. Sorry if I've missed off anyone else's favorite mainstream news channel. <laughs> uh, you know, I'll get an email off someone. Oh, you're such pro, whatever. I don't care. Um, in the UK, BBC is the big channel, Sky News. Um, are those less important now, given, like you mentioned, not just people dying off, like you say, producers aging, um, but people are getting their news from so many different sources though some folks it's tiktok others my kids it's youtube and youtube shorts mm -hmm. others are on twitter i'd probably put my hand up and fall into that category i think you've got a, a still a maybe slightly older generation get it on facebook mm -hmm. but is it just a case of we don't need it as much but they still draw huge numbers don't they so you can't totally negate any interest from those mainstream cycles can you I think that you're, you're, you hit the nail on the head, and, and this is a, an interesting technical point, which is if you look at the, the viewership numbers on any of the primetime news hosts on any of the major networks like a Fox, a CNN, an MSNBC, and you compare that just to large, you know, independent media personalities, journalists, influencers, whether it's on Twitter or TikTok or YouTube, the new media is already clearly outsizing the old media in terms of actual viewership and actual hours watched. So I think, again, the battlefield is sort of split. I think the mainstream media as an outlet and focusing on this issue is still important because the DC sort of group of power people, whether they're staffers, uh, consultants, legal, et cetera, still look to those channels as a way to understand the pulse and what to focus on, et cetera. So in the case of how do we drive forward um, the disclosure conversation, I think the emphasis on M mainstream media is not important to grow the pool of people that are learning about the topic, but it is important to maintain the pressure within Congress and other halls of power to continue to push the disclosure path forward. Whereas as it pertains to discovery and also bringing more people into the tent education, I think we have total control to increase the number of people who are demanding either more research into this topic or disclosure for the government. So I think to your point, we should view the mainstream media as serving a very specific function, but not overestimating the value that it has if they're going to be slow to pick up or the necessity to need them over the long term, given we're able to do the work as a community outside of that ecosystem. And I think that's true, not just in the UAP topic. If you look even at tech journalism, uh, or you know, political journalism, um, all the new media personalities are doing great numbers as compared to some of these old platforms. And I think the reason makes a lot of sense. People want independent thoughts, and it's harder to get those from network channels that have obligations to the type of advertisers and the culture of the company they work at. Yeah, um, I think historically you would go to the same, let's pick tech, so we're away from UAP as such, for just for a second. 
you would have the same reliable companies or names you would go to for, you know, a product review or a magazine or a newspaper. Yes. Whereas if a new phone comes out or uh, a, a, a case I'm looking for, I tend to go to like Marcus Brownlee and I'll go, ah, this guy I like and I'll take his opinion. I know he's got sponsors. I know he has favorites, but I think he gives a good, honest review. So have we kind of went the opposite way now where historically a couple of big news channels were run by the same people and they controlled the news narrative but is it not easy to control a narrative now just by flooding a market that's saturated with a lot of options with just lots of bs because yes. then yes. what what is true so historically it was here's the truth this is what we are telling you so this is what's true whereas now it's believe what you want if you want to believe a little bit of column a a little bit of column b ah, column z over here mix it all in together and make up your own news and that seems to be the way a lot of things have gone i think a perfect example of exactly what you're talking about of this new era of uh the networked uh the global network that is allowed to exchange information instantaneously without gatekeepers right social media uh covid i think is a perfect example of exactly what you're talking about which is you know, everyone had their own mix of different doctors or experts that's opinions matched what they already believed in. And then just they sort of doubled down on a pre-existing uh, belief system. I think this is a specifically a pernicious issue for the UAP topic because of how ontologically shocking outside of the scope of what we normally think about all of the different variables that you have to be thinking about at the same time to try to look at and analyze it's it's actually interesting i mean the some of the soul talks specifically the one by dr peter scafish i think touches on this aspect of how our the way our minds are existing different cultures have different ways of digesting reality right so just you know in the west the us uh the uk the eu we have some general similarities in terms of how mm. we the world from a materialistic viewpoint but Everywhere else in the globe, that perception is very different. And, and as such, the reason I bring that up is how you then have these ecosystems of networked information sharing and communication manifest differently based on that sort of base of how you culturally approach technology, uh, uh, religion, uh, politics, et cetera. So I think in the West, specifically like what we're talking about, there is a flood of disinformation on these social networks for a variety of issues that have geopolitical value and the uap topic for obvious reasons has geopolitical value so it is safe to assume that we are going to have actors in the space muddying the waters and we know this from the history that that's been the mo i think this is especially why it's important to have tentpole established entities brands that stand for a set of principles about how they view the topic, how they try to discuss it, express it, analyze it. And those can take different areas of the space. Some can be more conservative, some can be more liberal, but ultimately there is a core grounding principle that allows people to be attracted to it because, again, there is a rational, logical thought process behind how you're putting forth the information. So I think that's part of our challenge is right now as a community, there's so much information how do we distill it down in a way that's digestible, right? That's also taking into account varying opinions about what the information may or may not mean, because we also don't agree, right? People think David Grush is a psyop to increase military spending. Some people think he's a hero who's going to uncover the greatest, you know, conspiracy of all time. Um, but the, both of those people could also agree that UAP are real and represent NHI, right? Mm -hmm. So... Um, we can agree on the same set of facts, but then disagree on what the implications are. So that's part of the process, I think, with, which is great now with the types of conversation we're having is we're sort of moving down the stream to have these a little bit more nuanced and complex. It's a complex issue, um, both around the information, how we get it, how do we verify it, chain of custody, how do we share it, how do we get consensus? I mean, these are all real, cha real world challenges for any political movement let alone one that's so outside of the box for what most people are willing to engage in. 
So bringing it back to Congress, the caucus, where, where this may go, and I think I asked this earlier, so where, where are you thinking, based on what's happening now, we had a, a groundswell of movement, I think, up into around mid-December, things yes. shut down over winter, everyone goes home and goes on holiday, holiday period happens, and then we have this slow steady build up again as part of that actually let me take you to the the uap disclosure act you mentioned that was watered down killed throttled whatever you want to use what were your thoughts on what was positioned as possible you know this could be real solid groundwork to move this topic forward not one or two steps but you know hundreds of steps but what it looked like and were you surprised when it was taken down to what it was so, you know, I continue to maintain that the UAPDA um, was one of the greatest gifts that we could have asked for um, as proponents of transparency around this issue, whether it passed or not, because it created again now a new starting point. You can't go back to a pre-UAPDA era, especially after the uh, colloquy, the shared speech that um, two of the co-sponsors of the bill, uh, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and Senator Mike Rounds, you know, speaking about not only the importance of it, but also that they're going to continue fighting for the issue. And I think the reason why the UAPDA um, is so important is the language is very specific. Um, I think the way they defined, one of the biggest challenges we have is there's not a shared definition of what UAP actually means. Right. Mm. I think that's a huge detriment to actually being able to, at the government level, get consensus and actually get things changed. It being defined in the original UAP day was a huge thing, partly because we, we need to um, distinguish between temporarily unattributed objects, TUOs, which are what most people will push back on when you say, I saw the black triangle or I saw the orbs. They're like, oh, it's a balloon, it's a military craft, these things. And the idea that when we all say the word UAP, we have a statutory definition that states that that is not a drone, it is not a Chinese transmedium vehicle, it is specifically something that is of not human manufacture, and as well as a definition of non-human intelligence. So I think on its face, it was a huge step up, even if you wanted to quibble about the eminent domain clause and whether that was going to work or not. I wasn't as pressed about that because it put that conversation out there, which I think is important for us to have. What do we do if aerospace companies have this material, but only certain ones got it and other ones did it. You know, do those other corporations have the right to sue? Where does the IP go? Should it be public domain? I personally believe that there's going to have to be a massive reframing of IP and regulatory ecosystems if this bores out to be true, specifically related to the existing materials in possession of private entities. I'm of the opinion that any IP law does not apply to inventions made by non-human beings. And as such, all of them should be public domain. So one of the things I want to advocate for is having a conversation about creating a sovereign wealth fund, at least here in the US, around UAP material. So the idea is a public entity owns the IP rights to it. You have contractors, the government, uh, the public, um, sorry, old contractors that used to have it, new contractors that want to get to work on it, the government and the public, all as shared beneficiaries of any revenue that's generated or any research that's produced from that with whatever necessary classifications you need to do on some things. But that's a model we can start to talk about now as a potential path, which is what some of the pushback on the UAPDA was, which is we don't want to give up the rights. Well, okay, well, what if we give you the money and the access, but you have to share that with other people and we don't just take it away from you? I'm not saying that's perfect, but we can start having these conversations about how do we innovate our way out of the problem? I I was I, the only reason I was surprised that um, things like the definitions were taken out because they could have removed the board and removed the eminent domain clause, but kept all the definitions. I felt like that was one of the biggest pieces. They removed those two. I think that's really unfortunate, given how popular it seemed to be amongst the majority of members as they made public statements or we heard from the grapevine that there's only a couple of folks pushing back on it. Um, it did surprise me that they couldn't get it through, but I do believe, and I can't remember who said this, it might've been um, Nick Gold, that the idea that no one was using the UAP Disclosure Act, um, no one was bargaining for it. They were using it as a chip to give away in order to get other stuff. And that yeah. seemed to be what's played out. So, um, 
although it did not pass, I actually think that had it, either way, I think it's we're moving in the right trajectory and are maintaining momentum. And you can just look at what's happened in January uh, and early February, where in December, when it didn't get signed by Biden, we all were like, oh, this is the this is the death of the issue. It's going to go away. Just just as a list of stuff that's happened since the UAPDA failed. The ICIG briefing, where we saw incredible statements from representatives Luna, Burchett, Burleson, Garcia, you had Representative Burleson on for, I think, the first conversation in which a sitting U.S. congressperson actively speculated about the existence of interdimensional beings or something. So, like, there's, like, that piece, the DOD IG report, which basically reframed the entire history of Sean Kirkpatrick's statements about what they've been looking at, his media tour, which has been thoroughly debunked, the skeptic gorilla stuff, the soul videos, safe aerospace for Americans, the new journal that launched for UAP studies, Lumina, the plasmalized paper, all that's happened in 30 days, right? Let alone what we already know is coming down the line. So I, I, I'm just still incredibly proud of the work we did to be able to make the UAPDA as passable as it was, because the only reason it got there was the grassroots movements and the, the people actually badgering these representatives to take the issue seriously. Without that existing, I think it might not have even passed any of the pieces. It might have just been completely wiped from the floor. So I think kudos to the whole community for stepping up at that time because, you know, there's still a requirement for reporting from agencies. So we may start to get a little bit of a drip. And I think there are several efforts now, both in and outside of Congress, to revamp the same pieces a little bit tighter, a little bit closer. But I will say for those who don't follow U.S. politics closely, we are in a very dramatic, nor regular political environment, not dealing with UAP because of some of the stuff I mentioned earlier. The border crisis is a real issue here. Uh, we have a debt crisis that people are arguing over with spending. We just sent Ukraine $100 billion, we sent Israel money. We're in an election year. The Republican Party currently is having an identity crisis, and there is a power struggle over whether they will become Trump's party moving forward or whether they will maintain the old, you know, classic DC Republican perspective. All of those things mean it's going to be very difficult to get consensus, um, even if there's a lot of interest, because all of these issues would be viewed as having a higher priority. That's just my perspective, given the complexity of the current legislative calendar. Sorry, one last note. The, the One of the big reasons why is well, there's already a backlog of normal appropriations legislation and sort of the FAA reauthorization, like generic things that just as those move back in the calendar, there's already no space to just fit in UAP stuff. So I think what you'll continue to see is efforts around the edges, right? Field hearings from some of the folks in the House. There might continue to be whistleblowers coming to private classified briefings. But I personally don't expect to see a really major push again until the NDAA for this year, for 2025, um, unless there is an inciting incident such as any of these 40 whistleblowers choosing to come forward in that time period, I think could could very much change that dynamic. No, well put. Um, the definition issue, I believe, yeah, I'm with you on that, that. And I suppose it's easier for this to be controlled if you keep that definition loose around what is NHI, UAP, UFO, UAO, all of that stuff. It's far easier to control any kind of narrative around that you know, like asking your spouse, so, you know, you're sleeping around. Well, no, I'm not sleeping, but, you know, it doesn't mean they're not cheating on you. Um, that seems to be kind of the way it was kind of being danced around, wasn't it? Um, exactly. And, and and I agree that the, the UAP Disclosure Act was like, if you go to a candy store or a sweet shop, depending on where you are in the world, and you fill a basket full of chocolate and ask your parents, you know, I want all of this. And they say, no, you're not getting all of that. But you know you're not getting all of that. But what they do is take out one or two things and say, you can have these. And do you know what? Are you in a better place than if you had asked for both of those at the start and they only get you one? So it's throwing a lot of shit at a wall and seeing what sticks. Um, uh, and yeah, so I'm totally with you on that. I wonder you bring up the idea that nothing may happen till this year's NDAA, um, which is that big defense bill for those outside the US and big bill where everything gets signed into law and the UAP stuff is kind of shoehorned in there. Yes. I wonder, do you see ufos uap being any kind of election issue or given from an outside perspective i see this being one of the most volatile 
elections ever. Yeah. If not, it's going to be one of the most dramatic, for the love of God, with the looks of it already, given the, the almost celebrity status of who's involved and, and what's gone on in the past. Do you see UFOs, UAP becoming an election issue or is it just not going to, not going to go there? I I wish it would be. I really do. I think the only chance we have of that happening is if RFK Jr. remains a realistic contender in the race or if Trump chooses to make uh, Vivek Ramaswamy his VP. Without either of those two things happening, um, the Biden administration has made clear that they're not interested in disclosure. I think um, someone came out uh, yesterday with a comment suggesting as such it was uh oh it was um um uh, timothy galladay uh the former mm -hmm. uh head of the national oceanic and atmospheric uh, administration uh his belief is that the biden administration doesn't want to disclose which is why kirkpatrick is saying what he's saying um and if you look at trump's previous statements on this issue which are very minimal um mm -hmm. basically that interview with his son uh don jr yeah. and you know he basically was like uh, you know gave a non-answer and kind of moved on I, I don't view uh, Trump as having any desire to really deal with this issue or touch touch on it. Um, and I think the perception amongst Biden's senior advisors is we're under siege and we're not going to bring in a, an element with so many unknowns and just yeah. throw that into uh, the siege we're under where we're just trying to tread water and make it through the election and for another four years. So I think the Biden administration doesn't want to do, create any risky variables. And I just don't think there is the level of interest uh, from Trump. Now, I think that the, the path here is, is if there is enough, Trump is responsive to the people. So if there is like a drumbeat around this and he views it as a good way to do ratings and numbers and look like he's doing something, there is maybe the potential there. But I, I really find it hard, um, also given the media's uh, complete lack of desire to take the issue as a national security issue, even just at, at that point, like the DODIG has identified. Um, again, I still have not really seen any good analysis. I think there's maybe one political article on the IG report. And that's it, which is yeah. astonishing to me, given we're, you know, on the precipice of war in multiple theaters and we have alleged vehicles flying over restricted US airspace on a regular basis, which could be Chinese, could be Russian, and ostensibly would be something that the mainstream would otherwise care about. But because it has this patina of, you know, aliens, then they're like, ah, forget it. I find it really hard to imagine that it breaks through. Um, I felt more confident about it before, uh, particularly if the UAP had come through, it would have to be. But um, that can change, though, based on whatever may or may not come out that I'm not aware of or you're not aware of that has been suggested over the course um, of the last year or two. I do think that there's enough momentum where something new that drops, a first-hand whistleblower that drops, another hearing with the right types of characters. You put Carl Nell um, into a Colonel Carl Nell into a hearing in front of either the House or the Senate, I think that changes the dynamic, um, you know, uh, just given how he would speak to the issue. So while I'm negative on it, I think it's very possible that that changes given new variables. Yeah, I think the most likely way it comes up is, and I can't remember the the dude's name um, who got the question in like a local primary or whatever it was. You might remember he got asked it and he went, "Oh, you're giving me the alien question." I'm getting oh, the UFO. Uh, uh, Representative Chris Christie during the GOP. Ah. Debates. Yeah, he actually that's... was my former. I'm from New Jersey, so he was my former representative. So that's the one. Yeah, uh, I remember it being like Chris something. Um, so yeah. And that may be how it's used. It's the derisory, laughy, jokey question. Correct. Um, and I'd just rather it wasn't brought up if that's the case. Right. And like you say, that makes sense if it's going to be whistleblowers coming forward or real senior officials, a Carl Nell, and it being brought up in a way that you almost have to frame it seriously. But right. I think there's too much going on that... It's tough. Yeah, it's... Tough. it's it, it's not at the forefront of people's minds. It really isn't, regardless of Martin Scorsese adverts halftime at the Super Bowl. It's, it's right. just not. Right, right, right. right.
2024, people see a clip go, oh, that's cool, and they move on. That's that's just life. Um, they've done it with so many things. And I mm-hmm. want to bring it back to the to the caucus and the work. And I want to ask, Lester, what for you in the short time UAPcaucus.com has been up and running have been some of what you view as the short-term successes? I think the general, if you look at like our usage and our visits data, I was very shocked at how global our audience is. I think there's something like 35, 40 countries that have visited the platform since we launched in September, you know, which again speaks to the idea that this is capturing the imagination of people across the globe. And um, like um, MP Larry McGuire said at Seoul, that, you know, the US likely has to be the tip of the spear on this issue, at least as it pertains to the disclosure aspect, just given who we are and what our capabilities are. Um, so I think that was surprising to me, the level of global appeal. Um, I've also been really surprised at how much it has now enabled people because they have the tools and understanding of how to have impact, how many people have now individually spun off, done their own things either on their own or cultivated their own little movements locally. I just think how it's activated people to be politically engaged in this topic. I didn't necessarily expect to see it uh, transpire in that way. And I, I think it's created, you know, a center of gravity outside of some of the palace intrigue and sort of a North Star, particularly with our roadmap view, where we're again tracking what people say, predictions of someone says, oh, this is going to happen. And like we track it and we have ways for people to really be like, okay, like what's really happening? What have we accomplished? What have we not accomplished? So being goal oriented and seeing that now uh, cascade across different players in the space to, again, try to focus on where are we going and not get derailed with palace intrigue and some of these, what I view as efforts by disinformation agents um, to try to destabilize the topic. So I think it's been interesting to see people begin to coalesce around action or goal-oriented objectives. Again, knowing that every one step is not going to be the unlock, disclosure is not an event, it's a process. Um, but just sort of bringing that product thinking and that political advocacy thinking into the space and it expanding. Um, it's been great to establish some relationships with staffers and get sort of an inside uh, understanding of what they struggle with, uh, how they're trying to understand the issue, how they're trying to sort of filter information from good sources, bad sources. And probably the last thing that's been um, fascinating is the amount of builders, like software product designers, UX designers, who are chomping at the bit to now build other things that are like UAP caucus as an inspiration for what's possible. I mean, currently I probably have a half dozen people, really highly qualified, you know, folks who are engineers and stuff at, you know, relatively major companies who are now all beginning to try to experiment with their own different areas, whether you're talking about AI tools for UAP data or centralizing and digitizing case files, or how do you create like an onboarding system for new people? I mean, there's a lot of really, really cool ideas that I just never expected for people to sort of be like, oh, we need this, we need that, and I want to go build it. So I've just been really heartened by the amount of people who are like, I want to get my hands dirty and recognize that like, if not you, then who? Um, That's probably been the most surprising thing to me is, is just, you know, because we know about the stigma, I figured it would, it, it's still going to be something where people are like, uh, uh-uh. a lot of people are actually there. They've seen mm-hmm. the New York Times thing. They've seen the gimbal. They've seen Grush, even if just tangentially. Yeah. And they're just frustrated with the pace of government, right? Um, but they're not fundamentally as skeptical or as, um, you know, this is all BS as some of the skepticism I think we get to see a lot of in our own echo chamber on Twitter. So part of the reason I, I I have a TikTok where I do educational videos about this topic, and I started actually before I did UAP Caucus. Part of what also drove me to do it was the engagement that I was getting from, from that channel. The reason I chose TikTok is the audience skews younger. It's not necessarily the same overlap as Reddit and Twitter, which I think has a clear overlap of users. And um, I think the discover, this discovery algorithm is much better. So I've seen just an incredible amount of engagement from ostensibly normal, everyday people that are not super engaged, that are really well informed and really are following the issues, but are just not, don't vocalize it, don't talk about it, don't put their opinion out there. Um, But that's, I mean, that's how I ended up on Christina P's podcast was, Mm -hmm. you know, she had seen it on TikTok. She 
has grown and learned a lot from me trying to distill down some of the information for everyday people. And it's been incredible now to see like in my comments when someone says, oh, it's Starlink or, oh, it's just this. There's now tens, 20 people that are immediately, no, you need yeah. to look at this, you need to look at that. So it's like arming people with the knowledge, allowing them to make their own decision has been uh, flowering in ways I never imagined. All those links will be in the description, but I think is it Elroy Spacely on it TikTok? Is, yeah, it is cool. Elroy Spacely, that'll yes. that'll all be in the. Um, is that like a Jetsons nod? It is a Jetsons nod. Uh, okay. Elroy Jetson and Spacely Sprockets. That's the one. Yeah, I thought so. Um, and that's a lot of short term stuff, early successes, and I think you've seen a very quick, like you say, groundswell of potential support and help from others. So, what in turn becomes the long term goals for you? So one of the things that I'm trying to do right now, you know, because I think there's, again, there's, there's just a lack of infrastructure. And, you know, when I say infrastructure, like if researchers want to get the best available data sets for any variety of things, there's not really a platform that enables that. There's not like a GitHub for UAP if anyone out there is um, an engineer or developer. Um, we need more educational resources. We need actual like media campaign style there's like the um, here now, there's like, or now this kind of Twitter accounts that focus on content with a, politi a particular political angle and are pushing it out there. I think we have one or two orgs that are doing that. But I think for me right now, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm sort of viewing this as like a product management for UAP disclosure concept. So there is a first generation of UAP software that like sort of needs to exist that currently doesn't exist in a variety of different lanes that we can all then utilize either to do our own research and, and dig in deeper or to help bring more people in. So I think part of what I'm trying to look to do is um, make try to connect as many people who are building as possible and see how we can both collaborate and not double the efforts to create some of these initial platforms. And then the reason that I'm I'm focused on that as a piece is because that will then enable the industry is sort of like what Seoul is doing to have more high quality professionalization happening, which will make the efforts of going to members in Congress and then utilizing the insights, discoveries, growth and engagement that happens from that first generation of platforms and apps to help drive the, hey, look at all these people, look at what they're saying. You know, I bring this example up. One of the things that the staffers really like about UAP caucus is that there's a community board that people will vote on the sort of different things or comment on or uprank it. And they're like, this is a quick way for me to just get a sense of the pulse of the people because they don't know. Right. And they're continuing to look for that. So it's a little bit of an abstract concept, but my point here is, is we're not going to get a strategic vision from the insiders about how we're going to get to the end goal. So we have to build that ourselves. And I don't think anyone has really put that out yet. Some of the soul videos touched on this, but no one's put it together in like a, Hey, if we want this to happen here, are all the different things we can do and all the different ways the existing organizations can connect to other existing organizations and put forth collective uh, collaboration as opposed to living on our own islands, right? One thing that Nick Gold talked about with the call campaigns for the UAPDA was it was great to see all of the big players on Twitter that we all know that have different platforms all just say, let's all do the same thing. Mm -hmm. I think that's the only time that's ever happened. We all want the same ultimate end goal, generally speaking, but we rarely ever connect our collective energy towards a singular goalpost for any number of reasons. Um, I think it would be incumbent on us to find ways to better do that um, and, and using our collective energy towards focused core ideas. And we can debate that and conversate about what that looks like, but just starting to have those kind of conversations, again, proactive as opposed to reactive. So generation of apps, utilizing that to continue to establish growth in Congress, our number one priority is increasing the membership of the U Congressional UAP Caucus, not only in the House, but also in the Senate. If we grow that number, the UAPDA has much better chances of passing in the future. So if we, in Congress specifically, the number one thing we can do is increase either vocal proponents for UAP or members who actually actively join the Congressional UAP Caucus. And the best way I think we can do that is give them a reason to join by doing the work. Um, and again, I wanna be clear, like I'm not trying to suggest that people have not already been doing the work for 50, 60, 70 years. I wanna be very clear. That's, we're standing on the shoulders of several giants, which is why we've gotten here. But I think we're in a transitional era where we've gotten all the early adopters. 
we've gotten all the innovators and people who easily acclimatize to this topic to get to the first group of mass adoption, the way we message, how we message, where we go to message, all of those variables are different. So I think what I'm getting at is we can't keep doing the same things we have been doing to get to the next stage of public awareness and congressional engagement. And Timothy Galladay put on a good note at the end of his talk at Seoul about the four things that you need to get government to move forward, White House involvement, uh, congressional legislation, uh, interagency task force or counseling, and then an expert panel to help you figure out what best to do. He's like, until those four things exist, the UAP conversation within government will not move to the place we want it to. And I frankly agree with what he's saying. That's just the way the, way the system works. So we have a lot of work to do, um, but I think we have all the people to do it. We have all the passion and energy, and I'm, I'm really very optimistic and excited about the next months and years around this issue because the more time goes by, there's been no exculpatory evidence that's been presented and more indirect evidence that's coming forward that is continuing to suggest there's a massive plume of smoke here. Um, and we will eventually find the fire. We can argue over what that fire represents. <laughs> well, uh, before we finish up, I want to talk about those Saul Foundation videos. You've mentioned them a few times, Lester, and I think it's a nice place to finish on. We are recording this on the 13th of February. They dropped on the 12th of February, long awaited. I've not had a chance yet to, full disclosure, no pun intended, to watch them. I've saw clips, I've saw some comments online. I will be diving into some of those during the week. I know Dan has watched them all. Lester, you have managed to already get through those talks as well. Um, what were some of the, the key highlights, standout points for you from those Saul videos and I'll just leave it to you to kind of riff on that. Yeah, no, it, 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 I think it's, you know, you know, kudos to uh, Dr. Gary Nolan and uh, Dr. Peter Scafish for, you know, putting it together alongside David Grush and uh, Charles McCullough. Um, I think it was a monumental, a seminal event. I think it's similar to the UAPDA. You could maybe bucket UAPDA and Seoul as like a, a canon event similar to the New York Times 2017 article. Um, I care about small detail things. I'll start just about the presentation and quickly touch on the content. I think, you know, the, uh, the shout out, I think Matt Ford was involved in a little bit of the edits and the, the team that put together the actual video edits did a great job. The quality is very hi highly produced. Um, all of the talks were extremely interesting. Um, there are definitely things that if you're really into the topic, you've heard from about a little bit or touched on before, but I think seeing how seriously each of the speakers took it because they recognized the serious of the seriousness of the audience was great seeing kind of how people framed the importance of it and recognized how uh sea changing it was what was really cool um the talks i found most intriguing to me because i think they expanded my way of thinking about the issue the most was um peter scafish's talk about ontology and anthropomorphism i think was really fascinating because it, it made me think about this idea that I have a Western view, a Western perspective about reality. There's plenty of indigenous cultures, other cultures, uh, Eastern uh, cultures that don't have that same entry point. So they're, they're, the way that they define or reference what UAPs could mean or the spectrum of definitions that are possible is a much wider spectrum. Um, and just like that way of thinking, it was just, it was an interesting unlock for me. Um, Jeffrey, Dr. Jeffrey Kripal's talk on the history of religions in, in UAP, again, not something I'm normally into. I'm much more of a nuts and bolts kind of guy, but very fascinating, really opened my mind. And all of the talks about the actual scientific data are exactly what, what I want to be talking about. So this is uh, Gary Nolan's talk about metamaterials. This was uh, Dr. Beatrice Villarreal's talk about fast walkers and how they're going to use observatories to look at these um, these. Uh, transient multi-transient light sources that are appeared to not be stars but you know so they could be actually et probes as they're traveling in the inner solar system the other paper that was really good uh talk that i really enjoyed was uh, i could listen to dr kevin knuth talk all day all day love him great work and i think his i think one of the things that was really cool about the tone of all these talks was people weren't being like shy and like oh well maybe it's this everyone was like Everyone who's not looking at the data and coming to this conclusion is like, this is ridiculous. Um, Avi Loeb was fired up. Um, you know, Dr. Kevin Knuth was fired up. 
So it was cool to see people because they were surrounded by like mine being more willing to say, hey, uh, you come up with an interpretation of this data that is is different based on what's actually there and, and feeling more confident, I think, in the posture. And I think mm-hmm. generally as a community, that posture, both on the discovery path and the disclosure path, we now have real world anchors that are meaningful to more than just us as an insular community, but actually have real world meaning outside of our bubble that we can now piggyback off of and and utilize it to move the conversation forward. I, I, I thought it was, they're great. Um, I think everyone should watch as many as they can. It's really cool to hear people talk about it in detail. Um, and I think the, the the science that's there and that can be done um, is really fascinating. And to get going doesn't necessarily, to get more things going is not necessarily going to cause a lot of, um, cost a lot of money. And the other thing I think, I, and you guys will likely talk to it in your review, is there are a number of things that are coming out soon based on some of the research and stuff that was talked about at the conference, Galileo Project's expanding the observatory, full analysis of the IM1 asteroid, the metamaterials analysis. Um, I think Dr. Knuth talked about they have a mini nuclear fission reactor that they're going to use to try to actually um, attract the UAPs given their constant sort of association with the generation of nuclear energy. I think fascinating, Mm -hmm. fascinating. Sky Canada, the USO study, there is a lot happening. So my entry point is both with discovery and disclosure. I think both avenues are important. I think both have to have coordinated efforts where the bleeding edge of what's happening in research makes its way into what Congress is looking at. So they have more and more justification to push back when the DOD says there's not a there there. So overall, kudos to the whole team at Seoul. Um, it's something I can send my dad. My dad is a parasitologist. He's a science guy. Actually, both my dad and my father-in-law. My father-in-law is a uh, mechanical engineer. And they've kind of been like, oh, this UAP thing, Lester, why, why are you kind of, there's no science behind it. I can't wait to watch it with my dad and just be like, you know, like to go up to get your pick because he would actually dig into the details and be like, huh, I didn't realize that there's actually been so much work already done. And um, so I think soul stuff is great. I can't wait to see what they continue to do. Um, but I will just leave with this. I do still think that soul represents a little bit of the ivory tower to some extent. Ultimately, their audience, their customer is, you know, institutions, right? Academia, um, not necessarily the civilian public, although we will get some of the exhaust. Uh, their mm-hmm. primary focus isn't bringing us in the fold. It's bringing their contemporaries in the fold. So that being said, I still think there continues to be room for civilian projects to bridge the gap on engaging the public generally to be to where we are because Seoul individually is not necessarily going to do that. Neither is Galileo Project. uh, Neither is the mainstream media. Um, So so I do think they're great. um, And we also still need to continue to establish our own ways to bring more people into the conversation. Awesome. Yeah, I've got uh, Beatriz Villarreal coming on the podcast in a couple of weeks. So she'll be talking about her presentation uh, and a few others I'm just looking to arrange some dates with as well. Um, but yeah, it's it's an exciting uh, prospect and idea, and I hope that becomes an annual event, which I think is the the idea behind it, and a bigger event as well. Mm-hmm. Um, like you say, that expansion, and you're right, the, this isn't a UFO conference, you right. know, this isn't contacting the desert for academics you know it's right right. there's a reason behind it and it's not as some folks feared a cash grab but they're looking to see look we are scientists we are academics we are military personnel if we want to move this forward let's get investors let's get folks with some backing not just financial but maybe some powerful friends maybe some resources let's get them all together in a room and how can we work on this? It's almost like a little caucus in itself, isn't it? Um, yeah. uh, to kind of push this forward. And it's another avenue to attack Yes, this problem of disclosure, UAPs, and how to get it more mainstream. And from what I heard, that was very successful. And the, the conversations that were happening in and around the tables as everyone mixed were very productive and very positive as well. So I think that's something hopefully you kind of see the fruits of, you mentioned the exhaust fumes of, uh, coming out over the over the next few months as we as we kind of head on into the year um but lester listen i'm going to have you back on to talk hopefully very soon because it was wonderful speaking with you um you've been great and i could hear a lot more 
of your opinion, definitely too, um, anytime. Can you just once again share, how can people get in touch with you? Yep. How can they access UAP Caucus? And what's the best way for them to kind of use those services? Not a problem at all. For me personally, at Lester Nare, L-E-S-T-E-R-N-A-R-E on all socials. If you want to see, if you have friends, you want to get caught up on the issue, you can give them my TikTok, which is at, oh, sorry, it's also at Lester Nare, but it's titled Airway Spacely, UAPcaucus.com. It's a great place to look at what Congress is talking about, the latest research papers, links out to several different organizations. We also create briefing packets, so summaries of the UAPDA, summaries of the DOD and ICIG briefing, uh, reports. And we also have our roadmap and voting board where we're trying to keep track of all these predictions people are making. Just making a note, February 9th passed and Danishian's claim of a new UAPDA has not arisen yet. So we've moved that to closed on UAPcaucus.com. So again, we are trying to move into a, an era of accountability. Um, so definitely check that out. And I just want to give two quick shout outs, both um, Declassify UAP and Disclosure Diaries are also great resources for people interested in the government aspect of this topic. Awesome. Lester, wonderful speaking with you. Pleasure. Definitely, like I say, well speaking to you again. Well done in what you've done because it's had a wonderful impact and effect already. And uh, it's a uh, shame on me for not having you on sooner, but uh, you speak wonderfully on the topic and it's good to have you on board as well. So I, I, awesome. wouldn't, be, I wouldn't be here, Andy, without you guys. I was a long time listener before I got on the topic. So, you know, I think what you've done has helped enable, you know, folks like me to come in and, and have a good place to start. So I also greatly appreciate the work that you've done. I will take a partial credit on your website and 10% of all revenues made going forward. So thank you for that. I love it. Cheers, Lester. Speak soon, mate. Thank you.